Hello, and welcome to the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition's webinar series. I am Michelle Dixon, MBCC Program and Development Director, and I am pleased that you could join us for today's topic, Toxic Legacy of Early Life Exposure to Tetrachloroethylene Contaminated Drinking Water. I have the pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ann Aschengrau. Dr. Aschengrau is a professor of epidemiology at Boston University School of Public Health. She received a BA in biology from Northeastern University and her master's and doctoral degrees in epidemiology from Harvard's Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Aschengrau has been an environmental epidemiologist for the past 30 years and has focused most of her research in this area. She is currently the principal investigator of a study on the risk of substance use following early life exposure to environmental and social stressors. Dr. Aschengrau has also served as a member of advisory committees for government agencies, has taught courses in epidemiology, and has co-authored the best-selling textbook, Essentials of Epidemiology in Public Health. Dr. Aschengrau, welcome. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you everyone for joining me today. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about my research on the long-term effects of early life exposure to chloroethylene-contaminated drinking water. This research was conducted as part of our Superfund research program at Boston University, uh, which is funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of my presentation, I'll be talking briefly about the setting of the research, which is Cape Cod, Massachusetts, how tetrachloroethylene, which is, um, I may be using the abbreviation PCE, perchloroethylene, which goes along with its chemical name. Um, anyway, how uh, tetrachloroethylene contaminated Cape Cod's drinking water. Then I'll be telling you about the methods and results of my birth cohort study and ending with the context of the findings and some conclusions. So as I'm sure you all know, Cape Cod is a beautiful area in Massachusetts and a very popular tourist destination. There are uh, 15 towns on the Cape and current census estimates puts the number of permanent residents at about 215,000. The population is mainly white, non-Hispanic. However, there is a small Native American population present. And um, the area has undergone a tremendous amount of population growth since the 1970s. And it's a popular retirement area. And so that growth has been skewed towards the older ages. Now, a bit about the sources of drinking water on the Cape. The main source of drinking water is a large groundwater aquifer, which is tapped using shallow wells. The local water companies are responsible for pumping and delivering the water to the consumers through an extensive pipe distribution network. Most people receive their water from one of these companies, but some people have private wells. Uh, this diagram shows the distribution network of four different water companies that serve the Cape Cod town of Barnstable. Now, what is tetrachloroethylene and how does it typically contaminate drinking water? Well, PCE is a very important solvent that's used in dry cleaning and metal degreasing. It's estimated that about 650,000 people in the United States are exposed through their work. And because this work often occurs in small geographically dispersed and poorly controlled facilities like dry cleaning establishments and garages, uh, PCE is a very common drinking water contaminant. Various surveys that have been conducted have found about 9% of wells and about 38% of surface water supplies have some evidence of contamination. Now, while industrial disposal is the typical manner in which PCE contaminates drinking water, an unusual source of contamination occurred on Cape Cod. The source was a vinyl liner that was applied to the inside of the water pipes 
in response to complaints about the taste of the water. The liner was applied as a slurry of vinyl resin dissolved in the solvent PCE, which, because of its volatility, was assumed to disappear during the curing process. However, because of inadequate drying time, substantial quantities of PCE remained in the liner and slowly leached into the drinking water supplies. Now the contamination was discovered by accident in 1980 when the water was tested for other compounds. It turns out that an unidentified peak was seen on the gas chromatogram that was later determined to be PCE. A survey was conducted to determine the extent of the contamination and it was determined that 660 miles of vinyl line pipes had been installed in 91 Massachusetts communities. Now a substantial proportion, in fact 24% of the pipes were installed on Cape Cod because the area was undergoing substantial residential development at that time. Subsequent tests of uh, drinking water samples revealed PCE in the affected pipes ranging from 1.5 to 7,750 parts per billion. And this is a wide range and it depended on the rate of water flow through the pipe. So areas like dead end streets tended to have high levels of PCE. Now in April of 1980, the Boston Globe broke the story to the public and the headline said, pipes pollute some New England water. And the article said, and this is a direct quote, uh, environmental officials disclosed that water flowing into thousands of New England homes was contaminated with a chemical suspected of being a cancer-causing agent. Now remember, this is nearly 40 years ago and not much was known about the health effects of PCE exposure. But at the time, there was some animal evidence showing it had carcinogenic effects. Now this news caused a lot of consternation among the public and the powers that be. Uh, it turned out that digging up and replacing the pipes was prohibitively expensive. And so the water companies began a program of flushing and bleeding the pipes to reduce the levels to 40 parts per billion, uh, which was the level that was considered safe at the time, which is 1980. There were some other recommended actions for the public to take, like boiling their water, uh, purchasing bottled water, and, and installing water filters. However, by the time these measures were implemented, tens of thousands of residents on Cape Cod and, and well, elsewhere, were exposed to PCE-contaminated water for as long as a decade. And we know from the testing that was done in 1980 that the levels could be quite high. From the testing results, they were up to uh, 7,750 parts per billion. But even after the remediation, because the target was 40 parts per billion, the levels could even be at that level. And uh, I should say that uh, the 40 parts per billion is eight times the current MCL of five parts per billion. <clears throat> now, our team at BU has used this quote unquote natural experiment to learn about the health effects of PCE in drinking water among individuals exposed during adulthood and early life. And our early studies were um, case control studies of adult exposure and its um, effects on carcinogenicity. And um, we looked at breast cancer and, and published these results. And we found that women with high PCE exposure levels had a modest increased risk in breast cancer. Then we moved on to other studies, um, namely a birth cohort study of early life exposure, where we have focused for quite some time on neurotoxic effects. And that's going to be the focus of uh, the rest of my talk. So neurotoxicity of PCE, well, 
PCE is a fairly well-recognized animal and human neurotoxin. However, most of the research that's been conducted among humans has been conducted among occupationally exposed adults, so adults who are exposed through their work. And these studies have found that acute exposure can cause headaches, dizziness, unconsciousness, even in some cases death from respiratory depression. And chronic exposure can lead to impairments in memory and attention and vision problems. However, there's very little information on the impact of early life exposure, particularly in a community setting. Um, prior to our research, there were really only a few small studies of short-term outcomes. And so we launched what's known as the Cape Cod Health Study, which in, in epidemiologic parlance, it's uh, considered a retrospective cohort study. And um, the purpose was to examine the long-term neurotoxic effects of early life exposure to PCE in an environmental setting. And we took a broad view of neurotoxicity. Uh, we looked at diminished performance on neuropsychological tests, vision problems, structural brain changes, risk-taking behaviors, and mental illness. And so the source population for this study was uh, children who were born between 1969 and 1983 to live in the Cape Cod house with the vinyl-lined pipe. And so these years were chosen because these are the primary years of the um, highest exposure levels. And the study, as all, retros uh, as all cohort studies do, is basically you compare an exposed group to an unexposed group. And so here our exposed group were children with early life exposure and our unexposed group were children without that exposure. And um, so in, uh, there was a lot of work that went into identifying these individuals uh, and it took really quite a long time. Uh, so the uh, subjects were initially identified by cross-matching the maternal addresses on birth records with water company records on the location and the installation year of the vinyl line pipe. So we had to review over 14,000 birth records by hand uh, because during this period, um, the information on maternal addresses was not computerized. So we actually had to look at, at a certificate like the one you see on the screen. And you can see uh, it belongs to our, our former president, Barack Obama. And in any case, we identified records like this uh, and um, figured out uh, who was exposed and then randomly selected a group that was unexposed. And we had 1,910 exposed children and 1,923 unexposed children. And we followed up with the mothers and the children. We uh, found their current addresses and phone numbers and we uh, invited them to participate in the study. <clears throat> and the mothers and the children uh, returned self-administered questionnaires on uh, things like demographic characteristics, both occupational and non-occupational sources of solvent exposure, and other confounding variables. We also tried to get information on bathing habits, tap and bottled water consumption, and drinking water source, whether it was a public source at their home or a private well. And on the children's questionnaire, uh, we um, asked them to fill out information on what we called risk-taking behaviors during their teen and adult years. Uh, and uh, so the risk-taking behaviors that we looked at was were cigarette smoking, alcoholic beverage consumption, and illicit drug use. And here you can see we got information on marijuana, inhalants, crack, cocaine, psychedelics, hallucinogens, club drugs, Ritalin without a prescription, and heroin. Now, so that was, that was what was going on sort of on the data collection side for the participants. And then, but we also needed to match that with the PCE exposure assessment. So, so far we just have people who were um, 
tentatively exposed and tentatively unexposed, but we needed to do a better job in assessing that. And so we used um, a uh, historical reconstruction, so to speak. It's a le leaching and transport model that estimated the relative mass of PCE that was delivered to the residents from the prenatal period through the child's fifth birthday. We couldn't assess exposure for a longer period of time because of changes in the water system. And there were three pieces of information that we needed to determine the PCE exposure. One was the location of the vinyl line pipes. Two was the location of the subject residences. And three was this leaching and transport algorithm, which modeled how much of the PCE left the liner and then was transported through the water distribution system. So we went back to the water companies and got original maps of um, the locations of the vinyl line pipes. So here you can see an old paper net map with the vinyl line pipes that were actually highlighted with a yellow magic marker. And there were also handwritten notes on the maps indicating the pipe installation year and the di diameter of the pipe. And uh, we made use of this information in order to estimate subjects' exposure. So we entered all of this information into a geographic information system, a GIS. And here you can see one of the maps uh, from our GIS. And um, you can see that the vinyl line pipes are in red and that the unlined pipes are in blue. And one thing I want you to notice about this is that there's a very irregular pattern of contamination. And for an epidemiological study, this is actually very good news because it means that virtually next door neighbors could have different exposure levels. And it would all depend on um, the direction of the water flow through the pipe. So what this means is that um, the characteristics of the exposed group and the unexposed group should be quite similar since they're basically all coming from the same neighborhoods, just depending on the way the water flow, one is exposed and one is not exposed. And then uh, the leaching and transport algorithm estimated the annual mass of PCE entering the residence. And so what we ended up with was a map that looks something like this. It's the pipe distribution network, but it has the exposure levels on it. And so the dots on this map are called nodes, and they're points of water consumption along the distribution system. And each subject residence is assigned to a node. And here you can see that the blue dots represent low exposure levels. The green, aqua, and yellow dots represent medium exposure levels. And the red dots represent high exposure levels. <clears throat> Now let's go back to the characteristics of the study population. Um, so here we have the subjects with prenatal and early childhood exposure, and there were 831 um, who responded to our questionnaire and um, who, for whom you know, we finally determined that yes, they did have prenatal and early childhood exposure after our extensive assessment. And then there are four, 547 unexposed subjects. And, the, and so you should look down the rows of the numbers and you'll find that the numbers are quite similar. For example, the median age in each group is about 29 29-ish years old. And so uh, percent female similar, percent white, college graduate, ever had a job with solvent exposure, a history of mental illness, whether or not their mother received prenatal care, whether or not their mother smoked cigarettes during the pregnancy, and whether or not she consumed alcoholic beverages during the pregnancy. And, um, and then so you can see that um, the participants are predominantly white, female, and college educated. Their average age, as I said already, was about 29 when they completed the questionnaires. 
A small portion had jobs with solvent exposures. Nearly a quarter um, reported a history of mental illness, which was mainly depression. And nearly all of the mothers received prenatal care while they were pregnant with the study subject. Uh, and a fair proportion, I think it's probably typical of the time, uh, smoked cigarettes and consumed alcoholic beverages during the pregnancy. Now here are some findings for the risk-taking behaviors. Uh, and so here we have the frequency of risk-taking behaviors as a teen. So this is, these are just overall frequencies in the study population. <clears throat> so ever being a binge drinker, uh, that's defined as four alcoholic beverages at a time for men and five alcoholic beverages at a time for women. So that 35% uh, of the study population reported that. <clears throat> First drinking at less than or equal to 13 years of age, 19%. Ever used illicit drugs, <clears throat> so it's all of those drugs on the list that I told you. So I'm just going to take a little sip of water before I continue. Um, and so, uh, so there were, uh, um, so for the 55% of ever used illicit drugs, a lot of that was marijuana use. But we looked at ever use of major drugs and ever use supermarket drugs, so that's all drugs on the list except for marijuana, and it was 13%. And just to give you a flavor of that, ever used crack cocaine, 9%, ever used hallucinogens, 18%. And when we looked at these numbers and compared them to sort of national estimates from uh, surveys conducted by uh, SAMHSA, et cetera, we found that the frequencies were generally higher than national estimates. Now, what about the association between the risk-taking behaviors and tetrachloroethylene? Well, we found that highly exposed individuals, so people in the highest exposure levels, experienced 30 to 40 percent increases in the risk of using major illicit drugs. And these risks uh, increased to about 50 to 60 percent for the use of two or more major drugs. And when we looked at specific drugs, we found increases for crack cocaine, for psychedelics and hallucinogens, club drugs, designer drugs, Ritalin without a prescription, and even heroin. We found um, some increases in uh, certain smoking and drinking behaviors among highly exposed subjects, but the, the results were about 30 to 60 percent increases. Um, but I would say that overall, the most dramatic findings were for the illicit drug use. And I should point out that there were no increase in risk among individuals with low or moderate levels of exposure. We only had increases in risk, or we only observed increases in risk for individuals with the high exposure levels. Now, whenever epidemiologists do their research, and especially in a study like this, uh, you know, where we're looking at a, a very important yet really controversial finding, we really have to put the context of the epidemiological results in relation to other research, going from the, um, starting really with the basic biology. Is it biologically plausible that there are neurotoxic effects of PCE? And uh, so when you look at that literature, you find, well, that PCE is a small and fat-soluble molecule that it can easily cross the placenta and the blood-brain barrier, and that it has a high affinity for lip lipophilic tissues, such as the central nervous system. Now, the mode of action by which PCE has neurotoxic effects is unknown, but from animal experiments, possible mechanisms could include changes in the fatty acid profile of the brain, loss of myelin, so that's the covering of the nerve cells, the fatty covering of the nerve cells, 
that's um, necessary for proper nerve conduction, or apoptotic neurodegeneration, which is really basically the death of nerve cells. Also important is to see what other uh, human studies have found so far. And so I started my talk by saying that there were very few studies um, prior to ours, and most of them looked at the short-term effects of early life exposure. And here are the basically the four studies that are still the four studies uh, besides ours, looking at um, early life exposure and possible neurotoxic effects. So you can see there they were done a long time ago. Uh, 2001, 2004, 1988, 1999, and 2005. There are a couple from Canada, uh, one from Connecticut, one from New York. And you'll see that most of them looked at maternal occupational exposure to solvents during pregnancy. So looking at women who worked with solvents during pregnancy and what effects might that might have on their uh, young children. One of the studies, the Spectre one, looked at environmental exposure to solvents from a nearby dry cleaning facility. And this is where uh, it's really an amazing situation when you think about it. A daycare center was um, in the same building in New York City as a dry cleaning establishment. Um, you can see that these studies were quite small in terms of the numbers, the ends that are given. And they have mixed results. Uh, there are lower language scores and more behavioral problems uh, in two of the studies, the top two. And then the bottom two really didn't find anything uh, in, related to cognition or behavior or, or memory. So it's really a, a mixed bag. And so that's really where the, the evidence stands on this topic. And so I wanted to conclude with um, just some thoughts. Our study really demonstrates how scientists can take advantage of a, a very unique natural experiment to learn about the health effects of an environmental pollutant. And we had many fortuitous circumstances that enabled us to do um, a good epidemiologic study First and foremost, we had the availability of the historical data. Um, if the water companies had not shared uh, the, their maps with us showing the locations of the vinyl line pipes, we would not have been able to do this work. And so we're forever grateful to them for not, o not only for holding on to the maps, but also for sharing them with us. Uh, and uh, another fortuitous circumstance was the high prevalence and wide range of exposure levels. So we could look at low, medium, and high levels. And this is quite important because as you can see, the effects that we saw were really just present for the high levels. And uh, we were really just lucky that there was no, uh, or little or no confounding. And this was primarily due to the irregular pattern of contamination that I described previously. There were some challenges though. Um, you know, we're basically uh, using uh, historical exposure estimates and we're making a lot of assumptions in order to figure out someone's PCE exposure level. And um, there are errors in that exposure assessment. We acknowledge those errors. But it's very important to realize that when errors are made like that, they're called misclassification errors, it ends up biasing results towards the null, towards seeing no association. And so what it means for our study, because we did find an association for high exposure levels, is that it's possible that the true association is even stronger. And I would consider the main um, a limitation of the study is that we had very little information on the social environment. And this is obviously a very important determinant of risk-taking behavior, such as unhealthy alcoholic beverage consumption and um, illicit drug use. And so I'm happy to say that uh, we were recently funded 
to examine the combined impact of early life exposure to both environmental and social characteristics on substance use. And among the social characteristics that we will be looking at are adverse childhood experiences, um, characteristics of the family environment, the relationship with the parents, um, social support available to the children and now adults. We think it's very important to continue this work because PCE remains a common drinking water contaminant and it's, it's important to know what its impact is on the health of everyone, but particularly vulnerable populations, such as pregnant women and young children. The goal of our research is really to provide a sound scientific basis for policymakers to ensure that our drinking waters are safe for everyone to consume. And so here I'm just listing um, a couple of references. Um, I, if you want to email me, I'd be happy to send them to you, they're um, the publication stemming from the work that I just told you about. And of course, um, epidemiology uh, is teamwork. Um, I couldn't have done this research with, without my colleagues. Um, they've been terrific. And it, you can see a couple of them, actually, Tricia Janowitz and Lisa Gallagher uh, got part of their doctoral dissertations um, as part of the, this research. And so I'm, I'm particularly proud of that. So I'm going to end there and uh, I guess maybe turn it over to Michelle uh, and we'll take questions. Wonderful, thank you. I do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, okay. The first one is when you were looking at your, your control group, did you at all factor in whether, um, the exposure, was it all related to breastfeeding versus formula feeding? Oh, was that factored yeah. in? Yeah, you know, we didn't look at that. Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, we may have uh, gotten information on that, and I think that uh, the breastfeeding was relatively uncommon at that time period. But that's actually a, a very good point and could be, you know, the source source of the exposure of, um, to the young infant. Mm -hmm. So I think it just at this time period, there really wasn't very much breastfeeding going on. Sure. Okay. And what is the status of the contamination today on the Cape? Well, I mean, so the last pipes were installed in 1980. So we're talking about almost 40 years ago. And so we don't think that there's any uh, tetrachloroethylene left in the liner to be leaching out. Um, I have gotten monitoring data from the Mass Department of uh, Environmental Protection. Um, and it seems that sometimes they do have levels that are above the MCL, and they are probably related to uh, an industrial um, source of contamination, like improper disposal from a dry cleaning establishment or some other source. So not, but they're kind of like sporadic. So there really aren't, um, there's not an issue now with the vinyl line pipes because it's been so many years. Okay. I mean, can I have a couple of people who have asked if you could share a little bit more about your newly funded study? Yeah. So the newly funded study um, is going to go back with uh, to the people, the children, and now they're around 40 years of age. Is going to go back and send them a questionnaire. We're going to get much more detailed information on their substance use. Uh, uh, unhealthy al alcoholic beverage consumption and illicit drug use. We're going to find out if um, they have like substance use disorder, um, if they've ever had treatment, et cetera. So much more detailed information than we got originally. And then we're going uh, to get a lot more detailed information on the social environment. We're going to use questions from a very famous study called the 
adverse childhood experience study, ACE study, where they've looked at things like child abuse and neglect, uh, mental illness in the family, if a member of the family has been incarcerated, et cetera, and, um, uh, and, um, and get, get information on that, and, uh, but also get information on resilience factors. So I think it's very important not only to get information on the negative things in a child's life, but also the positive things that might have mitigated against uh, the negative. So the parental relationship, our participation in school activities, our religious organizations, et cetera. And so we've been uh, working right now uh, on the new questionnaire. And um, so we're hoping to gather that information over the next year or so. Okay, and I had someone who asked if, did you look at or have, did you find that where there was PCE contamination, there was also PCE levels? Since both contaminants seem to be found together, did you see that to yeah. be the case? Well, that's, that's really more from industrial sources of contamination. And so we don't think that in, in this, with this particular source, the vinyl liner, that there was TCE contamination that kind of followed along with it. It follows along with it more from, uh, you know, waste sites, et cetera. So, the, so that's what makes this study unique, is that we really think we can do a better job in separating the effects of TCE from TCE and from other contaminants. Okay, great. I'm going to leave it open for any final questions. Okay, wonderful. On behalf of NBCC's Executive Director Cheryl Osimo and our entire Board of Directors, Dr. Ashengar, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today and to share your research with us. Um, I think this has been a, a very interesting presentation, and we appreciate you taking the time to be here. Thank you. It's and I want to. My pleasure. I also want to thank all of our attendees for today um, for joining us and to let you know that the uh, recording for this webinar will be available shortly. Um, so thank you again and uh, have a good afternoon.